The topic that I want to discuss today is whether it might be possible to establish some sort of a rational basis for the perspective, the concept that God spoke to the Jews at Mount Sinai 3,300 years ago. The approach I'm going to take is based on some work that I did as an undergraduate. When I was an undergraduate at UCLA, my degree was in 17th century Christian literature. And my approach to studying these groups, I confess, was one of skepticism. That is, I approached every religion I studied with the assumption that it was not true. And my goal was to find a way to undermine the religions that I was studying. It was not the most objective approach. While I was doing my undergraduate work, I developed an algorithm. See, when this algorithm, I believe, enables you to unravel almost any religion on the planet in about a minute and a half. The way the algorithm works is this. When you approach a religious group and you say to them, why should I join your group? Invariably, they will give you a long list of the benefits that you can gain by joining their group. You can achieve a sense of internal peace, oneness with the universe, a front row seat in the next world, better professional life, better personal life. Each group offers its own list of benefits. Now, if you ask the particular group that you're speaking to, if you ask them, can I derive these benefits from any other religious system? Invariably, they will tell you, no, of course not, only with us. Which means they possess secret information, information that nobody else has. So then if you go the next step and you say to them, so let me ask you something, where did you get this information? Then they will re reveal to you something which I have dubbed the revelation narrative. A revelation narrative is the story of how any particular religion came to possess the secret information that you need to achieve their benefits. All revelation narratives in every religion I experienced follow a pattern. So if I was doing a four-day seminar with you, I would actually schlep you through 20 or 30 or 40 revelation narratives so you could see the pattern. But I'll just describe the pattern to you, and as you go out on your own and research religions, you will notice the pattern immediately. Christianity begins when Paul is, his name was actually Shaul, he was a Jew, is walking alone on a road on the way to Damascus, and he has this revelation. Jesus appears in front of him, tells him the whole story of his life. At this point, Jesus had been dead for 30 years, according to the Catholic Church. <laughs> Jesus appears, tells the whole story of his life. Shaul, the Jew, converts on the spot to become a Christian changes his name to Paul, comes back from this lone walk and tells the world, I've discovered Christianity, and that's the beginning of the religion. One man's lone experience on the road to Damascus. Islam begins when Muhammad drops to the ground in what looks like an epileptic fit, gets up from the ground, wipes the foam from his mouth, and explains that that was not an epileptic fit. Really, that was a prophecy. And this is what God told me. Not you, of course. You were not privy to this prophecy. But I was told. And this process continued for many years. And during this time, Muhammad dictated the, the messages that he found in his head after these experiences. And this became the Quran, a collection of surahs, a collection of these records of revelation. Again, one lone man's experience. Buddhism begins when a wealthy eastern prince, Siddhartha Gautama, settles beneath a Bodhi tree. With his body sitting beneath the Bodhi tree, his soul ascends to the eighth stage of transic insight. He achieves knowledge of all there is to be known and becomes a Buddha a god of sorts, and out of the kindness of his heart he came back down into his body so he could spread this technology among mankind. There have been other people in Buddhism who experienced what Buddha experienced, what Siddhartha Gautama experienced. In fact, in the history of Buddhism, according to some groups, there were as many as 44 people who achieved the state of being a Buddha. But of course, we only know that because Siddhartha Gautama told us. <laughs> there is no other person who's ever met any of these other people who made it to the eighth stage besides Siddhartha Gautama himself. So again, you have an entire religion passing through one man. 
The same is, of course, true of the modern cults. Whichever modern cult you invo- investigate, whether it be the Mormons with Joseph Smith Jr., hiking alone in the mountains, discovering these golden tablets, translating the tablets with a dictionary, the tablets were written in, in, in reformed Egyptian, which is a language only known to Joseph Smith. <laughs> Thank goodness, right next to the tablets, there was actually an, a dictionary that translated from reformed Egyptian to modern English, which was very convenient. <laughs> And when he was done translating the tablets, he then destroyed the tablets and the dictionary and only brought back the Book of Mormon. Because what do you need the tablets for anyways, you know? (laughs) And uh, that was the launching of the Mormon religion. All the modern cults start the same way. One or two people have a revelation and persuade others to follow. And in all these cases, the credibility of the religion rests on the credibility of its one or two founders. If they're telling the truth, the religion is true. If they're telling a lie, the religion is a lie. From an academic perspective, from the perspective of the analysis of religions, we call this zero credibility. There is no more reason to believe it than to not believe it. Given that's the case, it's just a wild claim, and the level of credibility is zero. For the first time, I applied this algorithm, this system for completely undermining the credibility of religion by analyzing revelation narratives to a major world religion which I had never tried to destroy before. I never tried to destroy it because I was brought up in this religion. I was brought up as a Jew. And from the time I was a little kid, it was obvious that Judaism is a joke. So I felt like from an academic perspective, it was a little bit dishonest to set up this straw man, Judaism, and then knock it down using my algorithm. Nevertheless, when I graduated university, I applied the algorithm to Judaism. and everything just sort of fell apart. And that's what I want to try to describe to you. I bought a copy of the Torah and I opened up the book and I started to read. And it really reads like any other revelation narrative. It reads like all these other religions. You open up and it says, God spoke to Abraham. Yeah, right. (laughs) Then God spoke to one man, Isaac. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Then he spoke to Jacob. Yeah, sure. And this is just classic, classic myth. I finished off the first book of the Bible. It was quite interesting. Got to the second book. Interesting stories about the plagues in Egypt. It's a bit difficult for me to understand, but okay, mythology is going to be passed along. Then I get to the section of the Torah called Parshish Yisro. And for the first time, I see verses dealing with the Sinai event. And it's clear as you're reading the story, this is the genesis of Judaism. And of course, what the verses there say is that approximately 600,000 adult men who were married to approximately 600,000 adult women, that's 1.2 million people between the ages of 20 and 60, and about 1.8 million seniors and children, a total of about 3 million people, stood at the foot of a mountain called Sinai in the middle of a desert. And all 3 million people, every single man, woman, and child in the Jewish people heard God speak. Okay, now I, I realize this has to be a lie. I mean, this can't possibly be true. It's a mythology like all the other mythologies. What struck me as interesting was the level of chutzpah those Jews have, (laughs) yes, to make such a claim that they actually believe that, as opposed to all other religions, which start with one or two, the Jews, of course, believe that theirs started with three million. (laughs) My only question was, how did they start this lie? And I want to be very specific. What we used to do when we would do analyses of religions was we would come up with very practical, very reasonable, very concrete and detailed scenarios describing exactly how the religion started. Muhammad gets up off the ground and says, it really wasn't epilepsy, it was really prophecy. That's very concrete. You can imagine him then telling a group of people that I experienced prophecy and here's what I heard. Joseph Smith Jr. comes back with this book and says, I have golden tablets and I destroyed them and here's the book. What I needed to do was, in order to unravel Judaism, I needed to come up with a concrete, reasonable scenario which would describe how the initial lie was told. 
We know that there was an initial lie told because every copy of the Torah that you find in any orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionist, nudist group, you know, like every place on the planet, all of their copies of the Torah read the same. Three million people heard God speak. So at some point, somebody told that lie. Now, what I want to know is, what did the scene look like, concrete, when this person or group of people told the lie that three million people had heard God speak? After several months of analysis, I came up with the following idea. I believe that the initial lie that launched this mythology called Judaism must have taken one of three forms. It either had to be what I call the past lie, the present lie, or the future lie. Okay, now I'll explain exactly what I mean. Let's start with the simplest scenario. The simplest of these is the middle scenario, the present lie. And then from there I'll move to more complex scenarios, the past and the future lie. In the present lie, what happens is a charismatic cult leader or a group of leaders comes to a group of cult followers and he says to them, this is the present lie, you just now heard God speak and he said these words. Now I'm going to quote the lines from the Torah. You heard him say, I'm the Lord your God. You should have no other gods before me. Moshe, Moshe, come up to the mountain. I'll give you the rest of the Torah. This is what the Torah claims, that every single Jew heard these three things. I'm the Lord your God. You should have no other gods before me. Moshe, Moshe, come up to the top of the mountain. I'll give you the rest of the Torah. Now, how do I pull this off? Whatever, I'm a very charismatic leader. You're crazed slaves. You know, like whatever the, the scenario is, somehow I persuade you to buy this. You say, amen, and the whole thing is up and running. Okay. <laughs> That's the present theory. We'll come back and do an analysis of this shortly. Let's move to past theory. Past theory works as follows. In past theory, I come to you and I say to you, you heard nothing, zero. However, long ago, your ancestors stood at the foot of a great mountain in the Sinai Desert. And there, they heard God speak. All of your ancestors were there. And they heard God say, I'm Lord your God, you should know the gods before me. Moshe, Moshe, come up to the mountain. And at that point, they all became Orthodox Jews. Now realize this is a lie. In other words, this is just what I'm telling you. Somehow I persuade you of this. You might ask me then, why doesn't my mother know? Why doesn't my grandmother know? And of course, the true answer to that is because I just made this whole thing up 15 minutes ago in the other room. <laughs> but... I claim the reason your mother or grandmother doesn't know was because after the Torah was given and your ancestors accepted it, they all became Orthodox Jews. Then the Torah was carried for a period of three or five or ten or fifteen generations and there was a disaster. What happened was, fill in the blank, there was an earthquake, there was a war, massive assimilation, whatever scenario you want to come up with. And the tradition was entirely forgotten from all of your families, which is why don't bother asking your mother about it. She won't know. Don't bother asking your grandparents or your great parents. They won't know. And now I, my name is not going to be Moses now. My name is Fred. <laughs> I've come to give you back your tradition, your heritage, the Torah, which I think the ink is just about dry on. And then I hand it to you. <laughs> there is present theory. The Sinai event just took place. There's past theory. The Sinai event took place long ago. There's one other possibility, and I'm including this just for the sake of completeness. The other possibility is what I call future theory. In future theory, I come to you and I say, you heard nothing and your ancestors heard nothing. However, someday, your descendants will sit at the foot of a mountain called Sinai. There they will all hear God speak. He will say these words, I'm the Lord your God. You should know the gods before me. Moshe, Moshe, come up to the mountain. Moshe will then go to the top of the mountain. He will receive the Torah. And here, I'm giving you guys an advanced copy. And then I hand you the book. <laughs> now, again, just for the sake of completeness, realize there cannot be another theory. Because since it says in every copy of the Torah on the planet, the three million Jews heard God speak at Mount Sinai, at some point, somebody must have told that lie. 
When they told that lie, where did they place the Sinai event? The only possibilities are past, present, and future. Therefore, there cannot be another theory. What I want to do now is a very initial, superficial analysis of these three theories, pointing out what I consider to be light problems, not significant problems with all three theories. And then I'm going to introduce you to what I call the bomb, which is a difficulty which I think unravels all three theories in one shot. First, the light problems. Let's start with present theory. In present theory, I come to you and I persuade you that you just heard God speak and then I hand you the Torah and you accept it. Now, to appreciate why this theory is not accepted on any university campus, that is, there are no modern secular biblical critics who believe in present theory. And the reason is because of a small problem called Applewhite theorem. And I'll try to explain how this problem works. A few years back, there was a gentleman by the name of Marshall Applewhite. Marshall Applewhite was one of the most talented cult leaders in California history. And I mean, if you made it in California, you're doing good as a cult leader, yeah? Uh, and he started two small cults. These cults serially exploded because Applewhite suffered from terrible fits of depression. And after he started this first small group, he was very, very successful, he was actually making a lot of money, had access to a number of women, which I think was also part of his goal. He slipped into this depression and the whole thing fell apart. Then he started a second cult, that lasted for a couple of years, and then that fell apart as well. And then Marshall Applewhite pretty much disappeared off the face of the planet until he appeared in Rancho Santa Fe, California. This is down near San Diego, in the La Jolla area. And there he started a new cult. And the way the cult began was this. Marshall Applewhite had a vision, he claimed. He said that we don't have to live these lives of quiet desperation. There's a better life, a better place, and we can get there. We can get to heaven if we can just pass through heaven's gate. Marshall Applewhite told this vision over to a few dozen people, and 40 people actually joined his group. Marshall Applewhite then had a second vision. In the second vision, Marshall Applewhite saw that the only way to walk through Heaven's Gate is wearing black Nike tennis shoes. <laughs> and all 40 members of the Heaven's Gate cult went out and purchased black Nike tennis shoes. Applewhite then had a third vision, three out of four. And in this third vision, he explained that women are going to have a much easier time passing through Heaven's Gate than men because there is this one part of human anatomy that gets in the way of Heaven's Gate. So one night after this vision, he invited the entire group to this mansion that they had purchased in Rancho Santa Fe. He handed out bottles of chloroseptic spray. It's a very effective topical anesthetic. And the guys just a couple of spritches. Then they handed out exacto blades. And it was over very quickly. <laughs> Every man who was a member of the Heaven's Gate cult just uh, removed that one small piece of anatomy. And then they all felt much better. <laughs> the group continued for a few more months. And then Marshall Applewhite had his final vision. I don't know if you'll remember, but a few years back, there was a comet that passed Earth called the hale bopp Comet. So the hale bopp Comet had a long tail. And at the end of the tail, there was a little bobble. And there was a whole discussion among astronomers about what that bobble was. Was it another meteorite? Was it hot gases? What exactly was it? And Applewhite told the group that the bobble at the end of the hale bopp Comet is the spaceship that's coming to pick us up. <laughs> and he had a meeting of the group. 39 out of the 40 members of the cult made it to that meeting that night. There was one member who didn't know what was going to happen who couldn't make it that night. And Marshall Applewhite declared on video. In fact, they videoed most of the meetings. So we have great records of this group. Marshall Applewhite declared on video that the time had come to ascend into the spaceship. And the only way to ascend into the spaceship was to consume a lethal dose of phenobarbital and then tie a hefty plastic trash bag over your head. So on video, 
there were 39 members of the Heaven's Gate cult who declared their faith in Marshall Applewhite, consumed a lethal dose of phenobarbital, tied a plastic trash bag around their head, and laid down and died. At which point, Marshall Applewhite, who was slipping into depression again at that time, said on the video, ha ha, what a joke. Then consumed the phenobarbital himself and laid down and died. The reason that you all, or many of you probably have heard of this group, I'm curious, how many have heard of Heaven's Gate? Yes, most ever in the room. The reason you've all heard of this is a total fluke. That this whole event happened to have happened 20 minutes from UC San Diego. And UCSD happens to have one of the best research departments on cults on the planet. And they dispatched a team from UCSD to follow the investigators around as they were cleaning up the mess at the Heaven's Gate cult. UCSD ended up doing this whole research project on Marshall Applewhite and his group. And what they discovered was this. Every single member of the Heaven's Gate cult had an undergraduate degree. There were many, many members of the Heaven's Gate cult who had advanced degrees, master's degrees, PhDs, JDs, MDs. These were highly intelligent people. More, they found that not one member of the Heaven's Gate cult had any record of psychological counseling before joining the cult. So there's one of two possibilities for this. One possibility is that these people are so not well that they didn't know to go get counseling. And the other possibility is that they were so well that they were not part of that 50% of the population in America that actually goes at some point to get counseling. So in order to clarify which was true, the researchers spoke with the families. And it turned out the families said that their relatives were completely normal, totally 100% stable before they joined this group. So you're talking about completely normal, psychologically stable people, well-educated, highly intelligent, who one day went nuts. People are gullible. And given a charismatic leader, they will believe anything, even something that asks them to act self-destructively. Clause A, people are gullible. They will believe anything, even something that asks them to act self-destructively. Clause B, as long as the lie cannot be checked. People are gullible and will believe anything, even something that asks them to act self-destructively. Key, as long as the lie cannot be checked. When Marshall Applewhite said that he had a vision that the only way to ascend to the spaceship that's coming to pick us up is to down a lethal dose of phenobarbital, is there any way to check that lie? No. no. Which is why it was believed. Now the truth is, Applewhite theorem explains the genesis of every religion you have ever heard of. Paul comes back from a walk to Damascus and says, I just met Jesus on the road. Can you check that lie? No. Siddhartha Gautama says, I just came down from the eighth stage of transic insight. Can you check that? Muhammad says, I just had a revelation. Joe Smith says, I found this golden tablets. With all of these religions, they conform to Applewhite theorem. That is, they all begin when one or two people have a revelation. That revelation is not checkable. The leader is charismatic and everybody believes it. Okay, let me ask you a question. Why did Marshall Applewhite say, the spaceship that dropped you off here is coming to pick you up? Have some phenobarbital. <laughs> Why did he say the spaceship that dropped your mother off here? is coming to pick us up, or your grandmother. So of course the answer is because if someone told you a lie, that your mother was dropped off here by a spaceship, which is now coming to pick you up and have some phenobarbital, you might make a phone call. And if one of you makes a phone call and your mother says, that's a cult, so you're going to be out of there immediately. As soon as the lie can be checked, you'll spread the word the entire cult will disintegrate. The theory is, any groups that ever attempted to start with a lie that does not conform to Applewhite theorem exploded. That's why we have no record of them. Because you cannot get away with a lie that is checkable. The main problem with present theory is that it does not conform to Applewhite theorem. In present theory, how does it work? I, Moses, come to you, the Jewish people, and I say to you, yes, you all just heard God speak. He said, I'm Lord your God, you have no other gods before me. Moshe, Moshe, come up to the mountain. And what could I do? He called, I had to go. I came down, and here's the book he gave me to give to you. 
But ladies, gentlemen, before I hand it to you, I just want to give you a preview of coming attractions so you're not shocked when you get to page uh, 78. Yeah, we'll start off here. This is one for the guys. Listen, guys, um, there is a man handing out exacto blades. Each one of the guys, please take one. Yes. It says here what you're supposed to do is, this is on page 78 of the Torah scroll. It says what you do is you spread your legs, let's see, shoulder width apart. That's correct. Then hold the exacto blade, it says, in your right hand, and then with a smooth downward motion. Oh, like that. It's over very quick. <laughs> what, that was a man hyperventilating. Whatever. Calm down. No, it's only the end you have to cut off. It's not the whole thing. Yes. What, 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 what do you mean? Why should you do this? Well, the gods who you were in speak told me to tell you this. Now, ladies, gentlemen, can you imagine being a little bit, I'm sure the men can imagine, being a little bit hesitant to, to believe this? If you hadn't heard God, you might not be willing to take this on. Here's another one. There are dozens of these. Ladies, Listen, don't worry. We're not going to be walking through this God for a second. I mean, this desert forever. Eventually, we're going to be out of this desert. We're going to come to the land of milk and honey. Ladies, you're all going to get apartments in Haifa and, and in Beersheba. If a quarter of a million, get one in Harnof. Come. It's going to be wonderful. Just follow me. But listen, I want to warn you, ladies. When you get to page 237 of the Torah scroll, there's this commandment. I should tell you about it before I hand you the book. It says here that, yeah, three times a year, at pre-announced periods, that's um, Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuos. So all of us able-bodied men, anyone of fighting age, we are all going to abandon you on the borders. And we're going to go up to Jerusalem and have a party. <laughs> oh, ladies, I know what you're worried about. You're concerned that perhaps the Egyptians or the Lebanese or the, the Jordanians or the Syrians are going to come pouring over the borders and rape, rob, and pillage. Ladies, don't worry. The God of you are speak is going to protect you. <laughs> you can imagine someone being a little bit hesitant. Here's one of my favorites. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, listen. When you get to page 592 of the Torah scroll, realize this is going on 1200 BCE. Yeah, at this point, there's no electricity. There's no freeze drying. In those days, when there was a good crop, people lived. When there was a bad crop, people starved to death. So it says right here in the Torah, this is the book I'm about to hand you, that, yeah, um, once every seven years, we're not going to plant. No, 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 you misunderstood what I meant. You thought I meant that you'll plant the first year, and then you'll plant the second year, you'll plant the third year, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and this way we'll rotate our crops, and the land will always be fertile. No, that's not what I meant. What I meant was, once every seven years, <laughs> none of us will plant. <laughs> Isn't that a great idea? <laughs> because of Applewhite theorem, this is rejected in secular circles. In secular academic circles, this is considered to be a joke. Now, there are people who don't have a background in religions who try in some way to make this whole present theory fly despite the problem of Applewhite theorem. People come up, people who don't have a background, don't know what works and what doesn't work in human psychology will say, you know, like, they were a bunch of, you know, crazed slaves and there was, you know, mass hysteria and they were hallucinating and whatever. They just believed what he said because they were all fools. If you're not actually experienced in the world of religion, come up with all sorts of crazy ideas of what will work. I'll never forget, one of my favorite theories was, he's the only person with a PhD I've ever met who actually believes in present theory, despite the problem of Applewhite theorem. I said to him, how, how can you possibly believe in present theory, given the problem of Applewhite theorem? He said, I'll tell you how it happened. He said, isn't it true that Abraham went to sacrifice his favorite son, Isaac? So I said, yeah, that's what the book says. So he said to me, Leib, would any normal person go to sacrifice their favorite son? Obviously, Abraham wasn't well. Now, isn't it true that Isaac, at the time of the sacrifice, was an adult? So I said, yeah, according to the book, it comes out he was an adult. And he says, and he cooperated? And I said, yeah, that's the indication from the book. It seems like he cooperated. He said, would any normal person cooperate and stretch out his neck so his father can slice it? Obviously, there was a developmental disability that was passed from Abraham down to Isaac. And it had a genetic component, and it went right into Jacob. Jacob passed it to the tribes. The tribes multiplied to Egypt. There was an entire nation of retarded people. Moses said to them, you heard God speak. And they said, we heard God speak. And that was it. The whole religion was up and running. So I said to him, you know, listen, about you, I believe this. But, but how 
do you explain that the highest, you know, per capita frequency of Nobel Prize winners comes from the, the descendants of the only known retarded nation in history? <laughs> Someone told me when they left Egypt, it said in the book that they each walked out with only one box of matzahs. Now, you know, even with the constipation factor, how long is that supposed to last? <laughs> so they were starving. They're walking through the desert. Someone said, hey, there's mushrooms. Let's eat. So, whoa, man, we are God speak. It's a national drug trip. When you speak to lay people, you hear all sorts of interesting ideas. In the world, in the academic world, none of these things fly. We know that they can't work, but we know they can't work because of Apple theorem. But nevertheless, for the minute, any idea that occurs to you that might keep present theory alive, keep on the board, because when I drop the bomb, that'll go too. One light problem with present theory is Applewhite theorem. Let's deal with future theory. Future theory is very problematic for the following reason. In future theory, I come to you and I say, you heard nothing, and your ancestors heard nothing. But someday God will speak to your descendants. Now to appreciate the problem with this theory, let me show you a strength of past and present and you'll see the weakness of future. Let's say present. I come to you and I say, you heard God speak. Let's say somehow I persuade you. What do you tell your children? Four words. I heard God speak. What does your child tell his child? My mother and father heard God speak. What does your grandchild tell his child? My grandparents, my great grandparents, my great great grandparents, my ancestors heard God speak. So you see, the present lie would create the sociological phenomenon that we find in the world today. That is, walk up to any Jew on the planet, Reform, conservative, orthodox, secular, anybody, and ask them, excuse me, did you ever have an Orthodox ancestor? What will this person say? They have to say yes, because before 200 years ago, there was no such thing as Reform, Conservatives, etc. There was only Orthodox. So given that's the case, they will say yes. That means every Jew alive today, unless they're the convert or the child of a convert, every Jew alive today, within 200 years, can trace their family back to some person who believed with all their heart and soul that God spoke to the Jews at Mount Sinai. That's the first link in a group of links going back in this chain to the point when the lie was told. We have to explain this sociological phenomenon, this, this chain of people going down through history who believed with all their heart and soul that God spoke to their ancestors. Now we're assuming it's a lie, but what was the lie that would have started this chain coming down through history? Present lie could have done it. Because in the present lie, you tell your children, they tell their children, and there's this rumor started that your ancestors heard God speak. Go to past theory. In past theory, I tell you you heard nothing, but your ancestors heard God speak. I persuade you. What do you tell your kids? Our ancestors heard God speak. What do they tell their kids? Our ancestors heard God speak. And you have a chain coming down through history that exists. A group of people saying our ancestors heard God speak. Now watch. Here's the problem with future theory. I come to you and I say, you heard nothing, your ancestors heard nothing. But someday God will speak to your descendants. What do you tell your kids? We heard nothing. Someday God will speak to our descendants. What do they tell their kids? Same thing. What do they tell their kids? Same thing. And you end up with a chain going down through history saying God never spoke. Someday he will, but he hasn't yet. That chain does not exist. The future lie cannot explain the, the sociological phenomena that we're facing, which is this link of people going down through history all claiming their ancestors heard God speak. Do you see the problem with future theory? It's a light problem with present, a light problem with future. One more, the past theory. The past theory is where all of the serious academics I've ever met put their eggs. And the reason is this, I come to you and I say, you heard nothing. That's good, because now you won't know that I'm lying. You heard nothing. But long ago, your ancestors heard God speak. But don't try to check. Because there was some sort of disaster and the tradition was forgotten from your people. And I, Fred, am now returning it to you. Can you check that lie? No. 
I'll say it was, the tradition was lost 500 or 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. The farther back I put it, the bigger the gap, the more untestable my lie is, and therefore the more secure it is. This lie could actually start Judaism, which is why all the academics I've ever met who doubt the Torah's divine origin put their eggs in the past theory basket. A light problem with past theories is as follows. In the synagogue where I grew up, there was, I think it was called the Cohen Chapel. There was the Teitelbaum Social Hall. I remember the Schwartz restroom. <laughs> each, each place they could put a plaque, they put a plaque. And of course, why was this? Because Jews historically have been compulsive about giving credit where credit is due. Not only in financial areas, when people make financial contributions, even more when it comes to theological or literary contributions. If you go up to any non-Jew getting a PhD in Jewish studies at any university on the planet, and you ask him, excuse me, can you tell me, according to the traditional Jewish mythology, the Orthodox mythology, can you tell me the name of the guy who went up on the mountain and brought the Torah down? So they'll say, it was Moses. Everybody knows it was Moses. It's a famous name, made a great contribution. Say, okay, uh, tell, tell me something else, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, please tell me. What's the name of the guy who led the Jews into the land of Israel? Was that Moses? No, that was Joshua. Everybody knows that. Okay, let me ask you. Uh, uh, what was the name of the guy who brought the Jews back from Babylonian exile into the land of Israel and started the Second Temple period? Well, that was Ezra. Okay. The name of the man who codified the Mishnah. Oh, let's see. That was Judah the Prince. Okay, tell me, what was the name of the guy who put together the Gemara? That was two fellows, Mr. Johnson will say. That was Ravina and Ravashi. These are all famous names. We know the names of everybody who made a great contribution in Jewish history. Now think about this for a minute. The single most important person ever in Jewish history, according to past theory, is Moses. For Moses went up on the mountain, received the Torah, and brought it down. He gave it to the Jews. The Jews accepted it. They all became religious. They carried it for several generations. Then there was a disaster. It was lost. And for 2,000 years, nobody knew about Torah. Until the second most important person ever in Jewish history arrived on the scene. And his name was Fred. <laughs> now, the problem here is, in an otherwise comprehensive Jewish history, there is no record of the greatest crisis ever in Jewish history. That is 2,000 years of the Jews knowing nothing about the Sinai event. And there's no record of the second most important person in Jewish history, Fred! <laughs> I actually ran a little experiment. This was actually quite entertaining for me. I went to an elderly rabbi in Jerusalem someone who has a consistent tradition going all the way back to Europe. And I asked him, all this Jewish stuff, how do you know it? How do you know it's true? And he said to me, uh, I heard it from my Rebbe. I said, yeah, what's your Rebbe's name? He said, my Rebbe's name is uh, Rabbi Yerucham Levavitz. I said, yeah, when did he live? When did he die? He gives me the birth dates, the death dates. I check it. I find several books that actually indicate a relationship between Rabbi Ruchim Levavitz and this guy. And I accept, okay, there probably was a relationship, this man probably existed. Then I start doing research. Who was Rabbi Ruchim Levavitz's Rebbe? And I find several Jewish books all saying that Rabbi Ruchim Levavitz was a student of Rabbi Simcha Zissel Zayv. I trace it back. Who was Rabbi Simcha Zissel Zayv's Rebbe? Well, he learned from a fellow by the name of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. And I confirmed from four different sources there actually was a relationship. And so I played the game until I produced this document. This is a fascinating document. On the bottom right is Rabbi Ruchel Mubavitz, the Rebbe of the man I was speaking to. On the top left is Moses at Mount Sinai with birth dates and death dates. Now, this is one of thousands and thousands of Torah traditions you could produce. Now, I'm not telling you, God forbid, that this is true. <laughs> what I'm telling you is, this is what those Orthodox Jews believe. I got this from their sources. 
And what's strange is every single year in a 3,300 year old tradition is accounted for. There's no record of a gap. And there's no record of a man anywhere on this list who after 2,000 years brought the Torah back to the Jews. So one problem with past theory is if it started when I told you that yes, we just recovered from a 2,000 year gap and I fret I'm restarting it, you might mention that to your children. And they might mention to their children there would be such a record in Jewish history and no such record really exists. Which made me question whether or not, in fact, Fred could have ever existed. So there's a light problem with present theory, the Applewhite theory, and there's a light problem with future theory. It wouldn't start the sociological phenomenon that we're looking at, which is a group of people moving down through history who believe that God already spoke to their ancestors. And there's a light problem with past theory. There's no record of Fred. But none of these impress me until I hit the bomb. And here I'm going to conclude. Imagine that I hold up for you a solid gold, 14 karat gold pen. And I show you that this pen is not only 14 karat gold, but it writes with 14 karat gold ink. So you say, you know, Labe, that's a nice pen, but you're a Jewish teacher. Where'd you get one of those? <laughs> So I say, you're right, you know, on my salary, I can't really afford these. What I did was, I have this handy dandy chemical equation, which enabled me to convert blue plastic into 14 karat gold. Alchemy, I did it, here it is, here's the formula. And you say to me, Labe, how interesting, could I borrow that for a few minutes? <laughs> and you run off of this thing, you copy it, and you hand it out to 50 groups of chemists and physicists to see if I was lying or if I told the truth. And you take this document, you give it to them all, and for 30 years, three times a day, these 50 groups of physicists try to reproduce my experiment to see if I was lying or telling the truth. And at the end of 50 years, they all come back and they throw the paper on the table and they say it didn't work. Tell me, what do you conclude? Was I lying or telling the truth? I was lying. You're right. Now let me explain how you know that I'm lying. Because all of you accept as the fundamental principle of science, the backbone of the scientific method, that anything that is natural will happen more than once. I can't say I just got lucky. If it happened once, it will happen twice. And if you can't do it a second time, it's because it can't be done naturally. I did my work at UCLA on what we call North Campus. North Campus is where we deal with the humanities. I had friends on South Campus. On South Campus, everyone was well familiar with this principle of science. Anything that's normal happened more than once. On North Campus, we adopted the same principle. I have friends who are in the history department there. I know that some of you studied history. Within history, they borrow this principle that anything that's normal will happen more than once and they come up with their own algorithm, their own theorem. And that is three words. History repeats itself. And for anyone who's ever studied history, you know that it's true. Now, not in gruesome detail. There was never another Napoleon and there was never another French Revolution. However, events like the French Revolution have happened over and over and over again in history and men doing things generally like Napoleon did do repeat. That is, the generic themes happen over and over, over again. The itsy bitsy details you don't see more than once, usually. We in the study of religions borrowed the same principle. In fact, one of my assignments at some point was to try to isolate the minimal number of themes I could come up with, which would allow me to produce every revelation narrative, every religion on the planet. And they're actually produced every religion on the planet with 25 puzzle pieces. That is, if you give me 25 themes, the themes that I specify, general themes, I can create any religion on the planet. There's the man who achieves great wisdom and then comes down and heals people. There's the person who becomes God incarnate, right? There's all, 25 themes I can create any religion you want except for one. There's one religion I can't create. There's one unique claim which is not specific, which is generic. 
That is only once in 4,000 years of recorded human history was there ever a group who said, quote, God spoke to a group of people. It doesn't have to be 3 million in the sign. God spoke to a group of people. That only happens one and a half times in human history. Once by the Jews, and once half a time, in another case I'll describe momentarily. How does this work now? Let's apply the theorem. Let's say you come to me and say, I'll tell you how it happened. It was a national drug trip. So I say, great, gosh, why didn't I think of that? A national drug trip, that could do it. Let me ask you something. Is a national drug trip a natural event? Now you want to defend your theory. So you say, yeah, it's natural. I say, let me ask you a second question. Do natural events happen more than once? You say, yeah, of course. I ask you a third question. Did that ever happen again? Was there ever another group in history because of a national drug trip all thought they heard God saying the same words? You say, uh, no. Then I say, then that's not natural. You say, oh, wait, 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 I'll tell you what happened. It was, a, it was an evolving mythology. They first said it was one person or God speak, then 10 people, then five generations later it was 100 people, then 50 generations later it was 10,000 people, then it was a whole nation. I said, wow, why didn't I think of that as evolving mythology? Let me ask you something. Is it natural for mythology to evolve that a group of people heard God speak? You say, yeah, that's natural. I say, oh yeah, let me ask you something. Do natural things happen more than once? You say, yeah. I say, did that ever happen again? No. Then I say, then that's not natural. You say, okay, I'll tell you how it happened. It happened this way. And you come up with any theory you ever hear ever in your life. Anything you'll ever think of when you leave here, any challenge anyone ever throws at you. And think of Kellerman saying, can I ask you a question? This theory you just came up with, is that natural? The person says, yeah, that's natural. You say, question number two, do natural things happen more than once? Sure. Did that ever happen again? No. Well, then it's not natural. And any theory anybody ever comes up with will fall apart as you apply this analysis. Now, there's a potential counter-argument, which I'll just go over very quickly. Someone could say like this, it's a natural event, but extremely unlikely. So unlikely that it's only happened once so far in 4,000 years. But it could happen again any second. And it is natural, just so outrageously unlikely that it hasn't happened yet since that one time. So just to borrow from statistical theory for a minute, we can say this in layman's terms or in mathematical terms. If the odds of an event taking place naturally are one in a million, what are the odds the event did not take place naturally? That is, what is the odds the event is somehow rigged? 999,999 out of a million. What are the odds of me taking a couple of dice, throwing the dice onto the table, and I tell you, I'm the luckiest guy in the world, watch this, I throw the dice onto the table, and boom, double sixes pop up. What are the odds that that would happen? One in 36. One in 36, that I'll get double, double sixes. Now, let's say I tell you, oh, that's nothing. You want to see really lucky? I take the dice, pull them back again, boom, throw them again, <laughs> and they come out double sixes a second time. What are the odds of getting double sixes twice in a row, so the odds are 1 in 1,296. Now, if I threw double sixes twice in a row, how many people in this room would believe, in fact, I'm the luckiest guy in the world? Okay, a couple of people. Now, I then throw the dice a third time and say, oh, that's nothing, watch this, right? I toss them again, boom, poof, double sixes three times in a row. The odds of getting double sixes three times in a row are 1 in 46,656. There is now a 1 in 46,656 chance these dice are not loaded. And there is a 46,655 out of 46,656 chance that these dice are loaded. How many people in the room believe I'm the luckiest guy in the world? I throw the dice a fourth time and I get double sixes and I tell you I'm really incredibly lucky. The odds of that happening are 1 in 1,679,616. At this point, how many people believe that I'm just incredibly lucky? Raise your hand. Oh, good, a few guys still, fine. Okay, now, I throw the dice another 100 times in a row, getting double sixes. At this point, the guy behind the craps table 
has called the police. And I'm just telling them, I'm really, really lucky, yeah? Okay, when I'm up to 175 double sixes in a row, so the police are putting on the handcuffs and they're dragging me out of the room and I keep saying, guys, what's the problem? There is a one in 14 trillion, 560 million chance that I could have just gotten lucky. Why are you doing this to me? And when I'm standing in front of the judge, I say to him, you know, look at, there is a one in trillions chance. And the reality is that if any of you ever witnesses an event and the odds of that event taking place naturally are one in trillions, then you would have to be crazy to believe that event just took place naturally. And that's why the judge doesn't believe it. I say, listen, there is a one in trillions chance. He says, my friend, you're going to see 30 years in prison now. I think there's a one in trillions chance, but no rational person believes that. The exact same thing is true here. If it is outrageously unlikely that a natural event led to the Jewish belief that God spoke to the Jews at Mount Sinai, then it must be outrageously likely that it was not a natural event, but a supernatural event, a miracle, which actually created this mythology, or actually the story. So it would turn out then that if you wanted to argue that in fact it was the one in trillions chance, and that's how Judaism started, you could do it. But you'd have to say it like this. Since you're betting on the one in trillions instead of the trillions and trillions, you're betting on the point oh 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 one instead of the ninety nine point nine 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 percent. There's a point oh 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 one percent chance that it was natural, and ninety nine point nine 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 percent it was a miracle. So if you want to say it was a natural event, you have to say it like this. You have to use this language. You have to say, I believe it was a natural event. Because it is a wild leap of religious faith to put all your eggs in the point oh 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 one percent chance. And anybody today who remains calm and rational will say, I'm putting my eggs into the 99.99999% chance. In fact, natural events happen more than once. And if this event never repeated itself, it's because it's not a natural event. I've given this lecture all over the world in the last 15 years, mainly at universities, most often to academics. I've never heard a counter-argument, although I would love to hear one. In a lecture about, now it's going back about seven years ago, I mentioned in the lecture that I felt there were holes in my qualifications to give this lecture because although I've traveled in many countries, I've never had the opportunity to visit India, and the oldest pagan group on the planet happens to be in India. I believe that the oldest religion, continuous religion on the planet today is a Hindu group in India. I'll tell you the name, but don't jump to conclusions. It's not the group you're thinking of. They're called the Hare Krishnas. And it's not the Hare Krishnas that you know of. The Hare Krishnas here in America are fakers. They're monotheists. They, they messed up the whole system. The original Hare Krishnas in India, they're polytheists. The original polytheists. They were probably the same sort of religion that Abraham was watching when he was growing up. Once after a lecture, a fellow came up to me in Jerusalem and he said to me, did you know that Hare Krishnas opened an outreach center in Tel Aviv. I said, it's not possible. They don't do this sort of outreach and they would never come to Israel. It's got to be the American Hare Krishnas. She said, no, it's the original guys from India. I know it's the original guys from India. So I checked it out. I ended up meeting with basically the director of outreach for their group. And sure enough, they were the original Hare Krishna from, from India. And the guy's name, I can't tell you his name for reasons you'll understand in a minute, but the guy's name sounded like Shrewdlu Goldberg. <laughs> so, no, he was not a Baal Chuva of sorts, yes. He was actually a friend from birth, Hare Krishna. His parents, yeah, his parents grew up in New York. Like any intelligent person looking for spirituality in New York, they went to India. <laughs> they there discovered Hare Krishna and they became Hare Krishnas and there they gave birth to Shrudlu who grew up a firm from birth Hare Krishna. <laughs> when they needed to send a team to do outreach in Israel, they picked Shrudlu Goldberg to be the man. So he came and I'm sitting with him. I said, Shrudlu, let's cut to the chase. I just want to know what's your revelation narrative. Shrudlu says to me, Oh no, Mr. Kellerman, that's not how we do things. Okay, so I had to adjust a little bit. I said, Okay, Shrudlu. <laughs> How do we do things? Shrudlu says to me, here we share. 
He says, Mr. Kellen, first you tell me your revelation narrative. It's like, this is unbelievable. Shrulu Goldberg wants to hear the Jewish revelation narrative. I just like loaded my rifle and fired with both barrels, you know. <laughs> the poor guy, for an hour I told him the entire lecture that I've told you. I didn't mean to come to, you know, like, you know, drag some Jew back to his heritage, but like, what can I do? God brought me here, you know? <laughs> The man is calmly listening to me. He doesn't seem, you know, moved at all by anything that I'm saying. At the end of an hour, I said, so don't you see, Shrewd Lou, Judaism is true. Your religion is true. <laughs> so Shrewd Lou looks at me and says, Mr. Kellerman, while it might be true that your religion is true, our religion, Hare Krishna, is also true. I exploded. I said, Shrewd Lou, you can't know that yours is true. Ours, you can know. Shrewd Lou says, no, no. We can also know that our religion is true. I said, how? He says, we also have a mass revelation. And what bothered me was the man was so sincere. And I said to him, what are you talking about? And he says, haven't you ever read the Bhagavad Gita? And I said, you're darn right I've read the Bhagavad Gita. It's a, it's a fa famous Hindu tract. It's about a battle between two peoples. He says, Mr. Kellerman, at the, at the battle of the Bhagavad Gita, how many people were present? There were uh, three million. He says, yes, Mr. Kellerman, and we have an oral tradition that the battle of the Bhagavad Gita, our chief god, K-R-I-S-H-N-A, descended in the sight of all three million people. He spoke to them and all three million people dropped dead just like your people at Sinai. So I, I turned white. I didn't know what to say. You know, I was trying to picture how am I going to look in a toga? <laughs> you know, and I told him the whole thing about God spoke to us. We dropped dead. We got back up again. The angels revived us. He spoke to us again. We dropped dead. We said, please, Moshe, you get the Torah. I said to him, like, let's go over this again. God spoke to them. They all dropped dead. What happened next? He said, well, what, what do you mean? I said, God spoke to them. They all dropped dead. What, what happened next? He said, well, they, they laid there. <laughs> I said, well, they didn't get back up again? He says, no. So I said, they were all dead? He said, yeah. So I said, then how do you know the story? <laughs> So he says, well, many, many years later, that God came to one guy, told him, and then he told everybody else. I want to close with a, a beautiful section from the Torah. I opened up a Chumash on the spot. I had the Chumash there, and I read him this passage. This is Dvarim, De Deuteronomy 4.32. You might inquire about times long past. Going back to the time that God created man on earth, exploring one end of the heavens to the other. This is basically what I did. See if anything as great as this has ever happened. Or if the like has ever been heard. Well, like what? what? What's the Torah's, Torah's challenge here? What's so amazing? Has any nation ever heard God speaking out of fire as you have and still survived? The Torah understands that it's very easy to start a cult saying that everyone heard God speak, drop dead, and there's no traces left. But every single person sitting in this room can trace himself back to a person who believed with all their heart and soul that God spoke to their ancestors at Mount Sinai. And from there, it's straight shot going back 3,300 years. And there is no way that such a lie can be started. It cannot be a lie. Because if there was some way for that sort of a lie to be started, we would find some trace of it in some other religion on the planet. Thank you. For more, please visit simpletoremember.com. Handpicked Jewish articles, audio and videos. Only the good stuff. All free. No sign up.